talk about the sun and climate, and don't ask me to explain how climate or the sun are related to the crazy weather we've been having this spring. Um, but climate is much more long term. We'll get into some of those details and a neat new solar mission that we're getting to build, have built, getting ready to launch, measure the sun real accurately. Well, let's talk about our climate. Well, what really drives our climate system? At a high level, this is it. This is what determines the temperature of the Earth. It's the incoming solar energy, and that's shown up here in the center. Total solar irradiance, all the different wavelengths from the sun that are coming in to the top of our atmosphere. That light comes down, and about a third of it gets reflected either in the atmosphere or by the surface. The other two-thirds get absorbed down here at the surface or directly in the atmosphere. That energy goes into heating up the Earth and the atmosphere. As the Earth gets warmer, it radiates energy away. And it radiates away at longer wavelengths. The incoming light is mostly in the visible. The energy that radiates away is at longer wavelengths in the infrared, 10 microns or so. That energy tries to go out, and a lot of it sort of gets absorbed by upper levels in the atmosphere, by greenhouse gases. Um, those greenhouse gases absorb that infrared radiation. The light visible goes straight through it, but they absorb the outgoing infrared radiation, and that heats them up, and then they try to radiate away. And some of the energy that they radiate comes back down, and kind of those little circles here, and some of it radiates away into outer space, and that eventually cools the Earth. If the incoming energy is greater than the total amount of the reflected solar going back out in short wavelengths, and the emitted infrared going out in longer wavelengths, the total incoming is greater than those outgoing, it is gradually heating up. And it gradually is, but it's this sort of balance between the two of them that determines what our climate is. Now that energy comes from the sun. Uh, these are not quite to scale. <laughs> um, the sun is about a hundred times bigger in diameter, a million times bigger in volume than the Earth is. It's 150, 150 million kilometers away. Uh, long enough that light, which will go around the Earth about seven and a half times in one second, takes eight minutes to get from the surface of the sun to the Earth. The center of the sun is up around 30 million degrees Fahrenheit, and the surface is a nice sort of cool 10,000 degrees by comparison. Most of the energy coming from the sun, almost all of it, comes out in the visible in the infrared. And that's how it interacts with the Earth for the most part. That's how the Earth gets most of its energy. So those photons, they take their eight minutes to travel from the sun to the earth, where they get reflected or get absorbed, and then that energy can get re-radiated. <coughs> That's what, like I said, gives us almost all of our energy. We have 1,361 watts per square meter. That's sort of one hundred watt light bulb per square foot um, are coming at the earth from the sun. Total amount of other energy sources, I'll show you in the next slide here, uh, amounts to a small fraction of that. But the combination of that incoming and a little bit of additional energy we have means we can look at what incoming energy we collect on the Earth and what outgoing energy we have. <coughs> As the Earth heats up, it gets warmer, temperature gets higher, the outgoing energy increases a fair amount as the fourth power of the temperature. So you strike a nice balance where the incoming energy heats the Earth. When the Earth gets warm enough, it's radiating out about as much energy as it has coming in. That balance is about 280 degrees Kelvin, or 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Now those energy sources, they can solar irradiance, spectrally integrated total amount of energy we have coming at us from the sun, and put that up here in the top. I'm going to call it one. Uh, it is the relative input. So relative to that sun coming in at one, listed a whole bunch of other energy sources that we have. Um, 
the next most dominant being things that are coming from within inside the Earth, the radioactive decay and geothermal energy. They're down, they're about one four thousand combined of uh, what the sun has coming in. And then you get into other things, how much coal, oil, gas we're combusting and how much that's heating things up. Radiation from the moon, some being infrared, some being reflected sunlight. All the way down to some really significant things like energy from cosmic radiation, uh, total radiation from the stars. Those are 40 billionths as bright or as much energy as we have coming at us already from the sun. You can take all those energy sources and add them up, <coughs> and they're 2,500 times lower than what we have coming in from the sun. So really, we're getting essentially all of our energy from the sun. One thing you'll see that's not in here, you hear a lot about climate and greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases aren't in here. They're not a source of energy. They regulate what happens to the incoming energy. Like I said before, most of greenhouse gases aren't these nasty things that we're putting in the atmosphere, they're natural. Water is one of the biggest and most effective greenhouse gases around, and it's in the atmosphere just on its own accord. And, like I said, the average temperature of the Earth is about 45 degrees. Greenhouse gases, these natural ones, are what make it a little bit more pleasant for us, something around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, roughly. So, but greenhouse gases aren't an energy source. They regulate what happens to the outgoing energy it sort of trapped on Earth a little bit. Now we can change those greenhouse gases and we are a little bit, but but they're not purely human caused. A lot of them are natural. So what does that do? We take all these energy sources <coughs> and it heats up the Earth, as we said a couple of slides ago, to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. What if we didn't have the sun? Well, we'd still have heat flux coming in from the Earth's interior or radioactive decay and geothermal. We still have dissipation of micrometeorites uh, for the whopping 60 billionths of the sun that we get. Well, we still have a few of these energy sources. Uh, what we would have is a temperature of about minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Not quite what we want to call a climate. So that's how big of a input is for us. It really is what's driving our climate system. In the climate world, it's sort of the 800 pound gorilla. Um, and, and luckily, it's a very stable gorilla. Uh, very placid one. If it changed a lot, we would definitely notice it here. Um, but luckily, the sun has been very stable and hopefully will continue to be stable for another 10 billion years or so. How much energy is the sun? Well, I said it's about 100 watt light bulb per square foot. It's 1,361 watts per square meter at the top of our atmosphere. Total output energy from the sun, I, I've got to read this myself, 3.8 times 10 to the 23 kilowatts. That's a big enough number, none of us can visualize what it is. It's a, roughly a million, billion, billion watts, kilowatts. Uh, let's try to put that in a little more perspective. That's enough energy, I'm going to update that a little bit, it's enough energy to drive the entire world's energy supply in one second of the sun's output for about a million years. Another neat bit, as long as we're talking about fun trivia that we can't fathom. The inside of the sun, the sun's made out of hydrogen. Um, you know, the stuff that floats vegetables if they <coughs> blow up really like uh, here on Earth. That stuff is so condensed in the center of the sun, it's up around 150 grams per cubic centimeter. That's about 14 times the density of lead. And remember, this is hydrogen. And helium. there's some helium in there too. But the core is so dense, and the sun is so big, it's 100 times the diameter of the Earth. But those <coughs> photons that are created in the core don't get to travel very far before they run into something else and bounce and scatter and, and, and they just kind of do this random walk. And it takes them somewhere between 100,000 and a million years to work their way 
out to the surface finally when they get to escape and shoot off towards the Earth. So the photons that we're seeing are somewhere between 100,000 and a million years old, well, plus that eight minutes of travel time. <laughs> How do we measure that? What we want to measure is the total amount of radiant energy coming from the sun. We add up all of the different wavelengths coming from the sun. It's pretty simple. You're looking for how much energy is going through a certain area in a given amount of time. That's called irradiance. It requires two measurements, one of power and one of area. So conceptually very simple. Any instrument to do this is also very simple. We've got the sun here putting out energy. We measure, we collect a certain amount of that energy. We define an area. We have a really well-made precision aperture here that defines the area over which we're going to measure the incoming light. And then we put an absorptive black radiometer inside, something that measures power. The ratio of those two gives us our power and our area. Conceptually, that's how simple the instrument is. Precision aperture with the collector behind it tells us how much power it's going into the instrument. And that gives us our irradiance. This is a picture of the sun, obviously, in the background with some dark sunspots. In, in about a three month period in 2003, <coughs> when you can see this value of roughly 1361 watts per square meter. Uh, have a time series of what the actual output from the sun is. But sun does change. It rotates. It's got a 27-day rotation period to it. And it has different activity on it. You can see some sunspots that form here rotating across the disk, but they change. Some of them grow a bit. And as they go across the surface, you see decreases in the signal of the total solar irradiance, which you're seeing here in blue. Here's a large group that's going to be coming on right across the center of the sun. Another one that follows it here. <coughs> the third one that forms right there in the middle. Those are some fairly large sunspot groups at a time when the sun was reasonably close to a maximum in its solar cycle. But that caused a large 0.34% decrease in the sun's output. That's significant if it were to last for a long period of time. Luckily, these move through quickly enough that our climate system doesn't have time to respond before the sunspots are gone and the sun is more back to its normal state. The sun changed like that for years at a time. We would definitely see it as a change here on Earth. But like I said, the sun, for the most part, is pretty stable. And the Earth integrates or ignores these short-term fluctuations. Anybody see Venus go across the sun last summer? Today? <coughs> Venus is a tiny sunspot. So this is roughly what it looks like. Eh, not, not tiny, <coughs> it's a medium-sized sunspot. Um, it went across the sun, and the sun is kind of moving around a little bit all the time anyway, and that's what these red dots are here. Um, when Venus went across the sun last summer, it caused this 0.1% decrease, about a third the drop that I showed you in the last movie. So, short-term decrease. Um, but effectively, it would be the same thing. It blocks a little bit of energy that we have coming from the sun. So, causes this <coughs> decrease here. Uh, but only for six hours or so, so again, not something that the climate system really has time to respond to. And our source spacecraft is lucky enough to observe both of the last two Venus transits. We also got to see a couple of Mercury transits. Um, well, no, we got to observe for a couple of Mercury transits. Can anyone look at that and tell me they see <coughs> Mercury in there? Because I can't. Uh, the, the red are our measurements of the sun's output. And like I said, the sun is always moving around at about 0.01% all the time, or 100 parts per million. Mercury is a lot smaller than Venus, and it's also further away from the Earth. It would cause, uh, on top of these sort of 100 part per million fluctuations, a 30 part per million decrease. And in faint pink here, I've shown where Mercury 
would be, and maybe if you use your imagination and you know right where that curve is supposed to be, you can say, yeah, maybe I see mercury there. But, but you wouldn't look at that and say, oh, there it is, just like you would with Venus. Um, this is how we were finding some planets going around other stars. And this down here is a detection of a planet around another star. To see an Earth around a sun-like star in another solar system, the Earth would be oh, almost three times as big as that Mercury transit is there. But you can see if, if the star that it's going in front of is moving around like our sun does, it would be still a pretty difficult detection. That's, that's what the Kepler experiment that you might have heard about is trying to do and doing very successfully. So anyway, that's a little bit of a tangent, but back to our sunspots now. They're dark, cool regions. Um, and I'm going to switch units and go to Kelvin or Celsius. Surface of the sun is about 6,000 degrees Celsius. These sunspots are cool, if you can call 4,000 degrees Celsius cool. They're also large. This is a medium-sized sunspot here compared to the Earth. They're magnetically active. About 4,000 gaps for the magnetic field in the center. Put that in comparison, our Earth's magnetic field here at the surface is a half of a gauss. So 8,000 times the strength of the Earth's local magnetic field subtended over a region that can be the size of the Earth. We've been observing them for a few thousand years off and on, but real actively starting in 1610 with the advent of the telescope. And here you can see different plots people made early on of sunspots and how they move across the surface of the sun. A little bit of history of sunspots. People didn't know what they were. Um, they had various explanations. Galileo wasn't too far off. said there were certain cloud-like structures in the atmosphere of the sun. Other people were looking for planets inside Mercury and were looking at the sun, figuring if they saw a planet go across the sun, they could detect the planet. So they were observing sunspots, wondering if they could be these intermercurial objects. Um, William Herschel was a brilliant physicist, but this wasn't one of his more brilliant deductions. He said that sunspots were openings in the bright atmosphere of the sun, letting us see the cooler underlying surface of the sun, which he presumed was inhabited. He may have redeemed himself a little bit later when he published the first correlation between solar activity and climate by noticing that the price of wheat varied with sunspots. Here is our 34-year record from different spacecraft shown in different colors that are measuring the total solar radius, TSI. And correlated with that, a lot of sunspot number down here. And you can see that when there are a lot more sunspots, you get a little bit more solar radiance. And you'll immediately go, well, wait a minute, I saw that movie a minute ago. And when there were sunspots, the total irradiance decreased. And that's correct. Um, but really, we have a couple of opposing features going on. Sunspots do cause, and they're shown in red here, sunspots cause a very short-term decrease in the output of the sun. But associated with them are these things called faculae, other extended magnetic regions that are much broader and overall brighter. They contribute a positive or an increase in the output of the sun. So I've got these decreasing sunspots and increasing regions from faculae, and they offset each other, or more so, the faculae offset the sunspots, and overall, the, the faculae end up causing the sun to be a little bit brighter at times when it's got more activity on it, about 0.1% brighter in times of what we call solar maximum in this 11-year solar cycle that you see here. Now, how do we trace things back in time? I showed you we had, since 1610, we've got one of the longest duration measurements of the sun, or any climate, direct observation of something relevant to climate, by measuring sunspots. 
Well, I've got these different measurements, and I'll explain in a little bit the variations between all of them. Um, but we have about a dozen different experiments, spacecraft, that have measured the output from the sun. And luckily, they overlap, which lets us take care of some of these offsets. <coughs> lets me put together one nice composite of what the total irradiance should be. And then I can correlate that to sunspot number here. And I can say, OK, I understand how the total irradiance is linked to sunspot number, and I've got a 400 year record of what the sunspots are. So I can kind of guess what the sun has been doing for the last 400 years, plot that up here. Then you can make some other assumptions. Maybe the output from the sun doesn't just depend on the number of sunspots. Maybe it depends on the average for a time or the length of these sunspots or solar cycles. Or so, so people have made different models that say that when the sun is less active, like it was back here in the uh, late 1600s, that it would be putting out less total energy as well. So we have several different models for how the sun may have been changing on long durations, long enough that they could affect climate. I can take things back further. When the sun's more active, we have incoming galactic rays that are coming in cosmic rays that come in from outside our solar system. When the sun is more active, it sort of fights those off a little bit. As those rays come streaming into the top of our atmosphere, they excite a lot of ions and create particles, create some, oh, we call them cosmogenic isotopes, create some unusual isotopes of elements up in the atmosphere. And by detecting those elements, we can detect the incoming cosmic rays for a long period of time. Because those, those isotopes get buried, get absorbed into living organisms like trees, or they settle out onto ice cores or ice, and then we can drill through ice, find different ice cores that depth in the ice tells us history of how many incoming cosmic rays we have. Some of those records we can take back 10,000 years or more. But because the sun, when it's more active, drives out or prevents some of those cosmic rays from coming into our atmosphere, we've got another <coughs> indirect correlation of how the sun has been behaving going back 10,000 years or more. These are all proxies. They're not direct measurements of the sun, but they give us an idea of what it does. So we have some history of what the sun's been doing. The late 1600s, if you study climate, you may have heard of something called the Little Ice Age, a period 50 years or so, where Europe was a lot colder. Winters were harsher and longer than usual. People were having parties ice skating on rivers and ponds that weren't normally frozen. Um, if you study the sun, you know this is the longer minimum the time for 75 years when there were very few sunspots. <coughs> Jack Eddy, in 1976, linked the two of these um, and, and published a paper that got people thinking a little bit more. This longer minimum period in the late 1600s, when there were very few sunspots, corresponded real nicely with the longer minimum. And it wasn't that people got bored with sunspots and quit looking for them. They were actually looking real hard because sunspots were so rare, they didn't want to miss any if there were any. So we do have good observations this year. There just really were very few sunspots for a long period of time. The sun was probably a little bit cooler than it normally is, and temperatures, especially in northern Europe, were colder than normal. So that kept people thinking that maybe there could be something between the sun and the Earth. And there are a lot of other correlations you can draw. You can see the effects of solar activity in plants. Uh, some smaller effects in general temperatures, clouds, uh, ocean circulation patterns, forest fires, rainfall. These are correlations. They're not direct causes. They're just, oh, I see this solar signal in this other record of some kind. The understanding that goes with this and the ability to do any prediction are much more difficult. Here's a plot showing the temperature of the Earth. This is globally average temperature for the last 150 years here. 
and different regions where we have measurements of temperatures on the surface of the Earth. The bottom plot being the difference between the early 1900s and the mid 1900s, where brighter or red colors mean things are getting hotter. The upper plot is the difference between the mid 1900s and about 2000. You can see that we've got things to be a lot warmer, especially across the Northern Hemisphere, Northern America, Northern Europe, and Russia in the latter part of that century than in the earlier part. Um, we can take those temperature records back in time. Again, with proxies, we don't have direct measurements of temperatures. And what we'd really like to know is how much of temperature changes are caused by humans and how much are caused by natural things, things that we can't regulate. How much, for instance, is due to the sun? There are a lot of things that cause climate change talked about the sun a little bit, it is one natural forcing or cause of change of the climate. The other one is volcanoes. We have volcanic eruptions, they can put up enough dust, sulfates to block some of the incoming radiation from the sun, and cool things off. There are some natural oscillations in the earth. People have heard of El Nino, different circulation patterns in the ocean that can change where warm and cold water is in the ocean. There are land cover changes. How we deforest places will affect how much energy is really absorbed down on the surface of the Earth. And anthropogenic forcings, atmospheric greenhouse gases, things that we can be putting into the atmosphere. All of these can affect climate. Here's a plot, and the black shows globally average temperature on the top for the last 30 years. The orange is a model, a fit to that, where I try to break down what causes those temperature changes into a few of these kind of fundamental components. The sun, shown here with its 11-year solar cycle in green. Um, volcanoes, in the tubo was a big eruption in 1991. It caused a decrease in energy um, that was allowed into the Earth's atmosphere. El Nino in purple, and anthropogenic effects, increasing greenhouse gases and other atmospheric effects. But combine all of these up, and you can do a reasonably good job modeling what the temperatures are, globally average temperatures of the Earth for the last 30 years there. I can even extend that record back further in time. This is going over 100 years now. Uh, where anthropogenic effects weren't so large early on in the 1900s <coughs> and then increased here. Um, but again, you do see spikes due to different volcanoes with the 11-year solar cycle. And you can do a reasonable job of fitting the temperatures like we do on the top here to figure out how, how much of temperature change is caused by all of these different effects. What we learned from this is that the sun and, and other natural effects are probably less than 15% of the changes that we've had in the last 100 years. We can even do this piece by piece around the Earth to see how different regions respond to each of the changes that we see in climate. So Super El Nino in the late 1990s shows in the upper left-hand plot the red regions show warmings due to that El Nino. Here's a solar cycle effect, where Northern Europe gets warmer during the solar cycle. Um, part of Russia gets warmer. Northern Europe seems to get hit a lot. Um, the anthropogenic effects, you can see Northern Europe's like down uh, here, as is part of Asia, by being a fair amount warmer um, due to some of the increasing greenhouse gases. Pinatubo cooled things off in the upper right hand plot especially over Northern America, which isn't too surprising considering where the dust was blowing. Well, let's get to our measurements here. These are the measurements that I, well, they're not the direct measurements, we've offset them a little bit, but here is our record of total solar irradiance for the last 34 years, from when we first started launching a spacecraft to get up above the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, these are, remember, that's a 0.1% change right there. It's not very much. Uh, when 
a third of the income energy is lost in the atmosphere. To start with, we can't do these measurements from the ground. We've got to be up above the atmosphere to be able to take reliable measurements like this. But here's our measurement record. What it really came from are all these different instruments, each measuring kind of on their own scale if you had a bunch of singers together, each singing in their own key. Uh, different offsets between each of these instruments. And luckily, there's overlap between them. So if you figure out which one's correct, you can offset all of them to that instrument. And, and that's exactly what we've done here. Um, this is the instrument that Guy used to work at last. He's retired now, George Lawrence, designed. And we launched it in 2003. And it's a better instrument than the others have been. But prior to launch, we had a pretty good story. We could say, oh yeah, these first few instruments, they weren't that good, but now we got to be really nice and consistent, and everybody agreed real well here, until we came along with this better instrument. People looked at it and said, oh yeah, that's a good idea. It's going to land right here, right in the middle of all of these three that we're observing at the time, and instead it came out a lot lower. One rule I have from that is consistency is comforting, but agreement isn't accuracy in science. So the fact that everything was agreeing real well here didn't mean it was accurate. It was comfortable, consistent. George, again, the designer of this instrument, and we could go on all we wanted talking about why this was a better instrument, but his advisor, when he was a graduate student, and told him that it's not enough to show that you're right, you have to show what's wrong with the other measurements. So we set about having to do that, brought together all these different instrument teams and went through the designs of the instrument. And it really came down to being fairly simple. What George had done when he designed the total irradiance monitor was he had put this precision aperture, the thing that collects, that determines the area over which we measure energy at the very front of the instrument. And then, uh, absorptive kilometers back inside here. All the other instruments were built this way, with the radiometer in the same position, but a precision <coughs> aperture up here. And then these larger view limiting apertures well in front to kind of block things off to the side, like the Earth, if you're rotating, orbiting around the Earth. But if you let in a narrow amount of light and measure your radiance down here, and then take that beam and expand it, you light up a lot of the front of your instrument. And unless you completely block that light, you're gonna erroneously be picking up a whole bunch of extra scattered light inside your own instrument. That's exactly what all these other instruments were doing. And that's what caused the difference between the lower value that we're measuring with the newer instrument and what the prior ones have done. That's the cause of these offsets I showed. So, we've been able to solve this problem, and one of those instrument teams has brought a ground-based version of their instrument here and recalibrated it. And sure enough, it's coming in a lot lower now than it used to with this big scatter correction. Um, a Swiss instrument was launched and did this test, this calibration prior to launch, being aware that the scatter could be a big issue, and it's agreeing real well now. So, now we're back to where we've got some good understanding of why we've had these big offsets in these measurements. Um, but I need to remind myself that consistency is comforting, agreement's not accuracy, so we need to get complacent that now we've got good agreement again, we can quit. Um, that would be neat, but uh, this isn't also the first time that a physical constant has changed. These are 25 years, ending about 1975, of variations in different constants. Planck's constant, the electron charge, uh, electron mass. In all these cases, you notice a couple of things. Where we ultimately end up is well outside the error bars that people attributed early on. <coughs> Another thing you can see is a lot of these are kind of monotonic. We're getting better and better, closer and closer to our final value. If somebody measures here, and that's sort of the accepted value for Planck's constant, and you come along with an experiment, and you measure something wildly higher or wildly lower, you, you try to adjust it, figure out what you did wrong. 
get back to that value. There's some social physics going on in here as much as there is real physics. So, so things are trending one way, and you come up with something way far the other direction. You look real hard to find why, why you might want to move your value up. Whereas if things are trending one way and you measure a little higher, you go, oh, well, maybe I'm correct. And, um, but another rule is experimentalists are optimists. Uh, they, they like to underestimate their error bars. So it's not the first time that we've had a big change in what's the accepted value. So now we've got agreement roughly like this. And are, are we there yet? No. What I want to be able to do is take that region and blow it up and say, oh, why is that so bad? And make that one even better. Um, so, so we're not done. Um, the rule is in research, you're never going to be done. Uh, or you may as well keep, quit. keep asking questions. Keep improving things. So we want to measure climate. We need to understand how the sun's varying over a long time period. For a climate record, temperature you can measure. You go outside today with your thermometer, you go outside tomorrow, you can easily measure a difference. Um, with climate, you're looking for long-term changes in how temperatures are changing over decades or centuries. Um, so you need an accurate record, something that's going to go on for a long period of time. How accurate does it need to be? That depends what you're measuring. How much is it changing? So you also need patience because you need to wait for a long period of time to see changes. For the sun, uh, these are the different sort of estimates people have of how the sun may have changed coming into or going out of, in this case, this longer minimum era. If the sun were changing long term like that today, we want to be able to measure it. So let's take that region and blow it up and say, what would it take to be able to measure a long-term change in the sun's output? And it would take something in between these two, perhaps. Um, they're increasing at 0.1%, um, 0.1% increase over 80 to 100 years. Think about your thermometer, 0.1%, maybe that's a tenth of a degree. You want to measure temperatures that are changing at the tenth of a degree level here over 80 years. Now you could take your thermometer and go outside today and measure temperature. Maybe if you're really accurate, you could go outside tomorrow and measure something that's a tenth of a degree higher. Maybe you could get that level of sensitivity in your thermometer. You want to do this over 80 or 100 years. Uh, is your thermometer that stable for that long? Do you? drop it or stick it in your pocket and break it one day accidentally and have to get another thermometer? Um, do you get bored doing this measurement and your brother takes over and maybe he measures a little bit differently, looks at this? So these are not, not easy measurements to make to extend over that period of time. Measure something like that over this longer minimum <laughs> you need an instrument that's stable to 0.001% per year. So, hundredth of a degree, you want to measure per year, stability in your thermometer. They're, they're not easy. But that's what you need for climate. Now, how do you take those different measurements that I showed from total irradiance and put them together? Different people have done different ways, and they've produced these three different plots these composites of what your radiance is. And some of them show the sun coming back from one solar minimum period to the next to roughly the same level. Others show the sun getting brighter with time between one solar minimum and the next. And what I've plotted on here, though, is this 10 parts per million or 0.001% per year stability that we need to be able to achieve or actually be much better than to be able to see long-term changes in the sun's output. So this is kind of the minimum that we need to be able to do to see a long-term change like coming out of under minimum. Um, and it's borderline as to whether we're close to that with the existing mode. Well, the existing record really isn't there yet. But we are trying to make it good enough to be there. How critical is that? 
different researchers have come up with different ways. Which one of those different composites in the last plot we use fitted to temperatures? These are temperatures, globally average temperatures in green, kind of smoothed in black. How much of that I can attribute to the sun depends on which composite you use. This blue curve might say that 15% roughly of that change is from the sun. A more extreme one that not many people believe, but it still gets published, is shown in red here, uh, saying that, boy, well, almost 70% of that change is due to the sun. Not very realistic, but uh, causes a lot of controversy. So it's important to be able to get these measurements correct. To get them correct, we need good continuity. I've shown you all the different offsets between these instruments. If we were to have a break in the measurement record here, and come back in the future with a different instrument, and it was offset from one of these, but we had no measurements in between, how would you connect one from the other? How would you know if that offset is due to differences between the instrument or if it's due to a slight change in the sun in that period? You wouldn't be able to figure it out. So you need to keep the measurements continuous. And we've been able to so far. Uh, the plan, we've got our source instrument, the total irradiance monitor on the source spacecraft that launched in 2003. Um, we're planning to be following that up with a GLORI instrument, um, and then eventually with something called TSIS that NOAA was going to be flying in 2000, and oh, a while ago, it was 2014. We were worried because source went up in 2003 as a five-year mission, uh, but much like the Starship Enterprise, the five-year mission is going and going and going. Um, and you know, we're just hoping it keeps going. It's, it's now over 10 years old and still going, hopefully. But we plan to follow that up with the story mission um, prior to the launch of the follow-on. Um, but Glory was a spectacular launch. Um, it was a nighttime launch, and they really are neat to watch. Um, so this went up out of Vandenberg Air Force in California. Um, and it was spectacular to see launch, but unfortunately, a few minutes after it went up, it also came down and crashed in the ocean, and we didn't get that on orbit. And it takes long enough to build these spacecraft instruments that you don't have another one just ready to go the next day. So quite concerned that we were going to lose our measurement record because of the loss of this spacecraft. got some interesting quotes after this crashed. Um, and let's see, I'm sorry, I went, went too far. You get a lot of questions from the press when you have a big catastrophic event like this. Uh, brilliant and rather uncouth one from the Daily Camera was describe what it feels like to lose all of your 10 years of work when you realize the instrument wasn't going to make it. A school teacher asking, any chance of anything being saved, or is it just $400 million worth of junk? But some more positive ones. Rocket science isn't easy. It's not something you're immediately rapidly, quickly gratified. Um, one coworker, uh, colleague from another institute that I've known for a while but didn't know well, said, you didn't lose a child, but I bet it feels damn close. And, and, and at that point I knew, yeah, he, he doesn't have kids. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's a nuisance to lose this, but it's really an instrument. We can make another one of these. Um, it'll take a while, and it's a nuisance. And one that I really like, and this is from a woman who was a senior at the time in charge of another piece of hardware that CU had built on the Glory launch, on the Glory spacecraft, said, we may have lost our hardware tonight, but we won't ever lose the experience we've gained or the times we've shared. So some, some really nice positive ones to counteract some of what the press asked. So where are we now? We've just lost our Glory spacecraft, which was supposed to be filling this gap and continuing the measurements. Um, 
people bring their hands and go, oh, well, there's this follow-on. Maybe that will, hopefully that will move forward a little bit. We can speed that up. Hopefully these ones will keep going. And I'm always reminded of uh, Vice President at Paul Aerospace, who was very sharp. Uh, hope is not a strategy. Uh, hoping things are going to keep lasting. Hoping we'll speed up the next one. Not a good way to build a spacecraft program relying on continuity. So, we got around hope. We took an existing instrument, one that we had in the lab that we <coughs> built at the same time that we built the one that launched on source, and said we could get that ready for a flight if there were an opportunity. And an opportunity came along on an Air Force program. Um, and we did this. We took this instrument, very different from normal spacecraft programs. Normal programs can take several years with lots of reviews, lots of oversight from NASA. This was five months between when we were told, go ahead and do this, and when we delivered the instrument to Ball, who had built the spacecraft, who was finishing up the spacecraft. And, and this really was a fun program. This was something that was done quickly. It was done relatively inexpensively for spacecraft programs. The team was really focused on making progress, making milestones all the way through it. Real excited because you could see progress day to day. And, and, and that was encouraging. So people were even more motivated to make more progress. And, and it just kept going that way for the entire five months. NASA and NOAA were real good, except the only way we can do this in time is if we don't have to mess with many reviews. And they were good about just trusting us to make decisions and do things, and they quit looking over our shoulders as much as they would in a normal program, and that made a big difference. The progress, like I said, was encouraging. We looked at the schedule and said, there's a lot of stuff we're not going to have time to do on here. Some calibrations that would be nice to have, but we don't have time for them. I go, well, I'll come in this weekend. I'll just get that done. And they did. But again, because you could see the progress so well. We had, you know, Ball was building the spacecraft. Having them so close by, just uh, three quarters of a mile away, was real convenient. Because you could get people to people interactions that you wouldn't get if you were doing all of this through documentation and sending off to a very distant facility. And the Air Force is real good about just making quick decisions and getting on with things. So overall, these all came together real nicely, made this a fun, enthusiastic program for everyone, and a quick one and a cheap one. Um, and something that I think we ought to try to do intentionally instead of just because we're forced into it. So where are we going eventually? We still want to get back to this overall understanding of climate. We need to be able to continue to measure the incoming total solar irradiance. We also want to start measuring some of the outgoing radiation. And we have been to some extent, but we, we do want really good measurements of the outgoing shortwave and the outgoing infrared radiation. We have been making some progress on that too. Um, come up with a better value of exactly what that incoming value is. And here it's, it's 341 watts per square meter. Remember, I put the same 1361. Uh, this is a this is a global average. 1361 is the total amount of energy you have coming at you from the sun. But it's got to be split around the entire surface of the Earth. That there's a factor of four that you decrease that by roughly to get down to this value. And even this value is a little hot. It's our new lower value. That should really be about 340.25. But roughly, we've improved the knowledge of that incoming radiation. There are other instruments uh, that measure the outgoing radiation. And one of them in particular now has an uh, imbalance, that is, they're measuring a little bit less going out than we have coming in. Uh, but at least we're getting closer to being within the uncertainties. That outgoing radiation is a lot more difficult. I've already shown you how difficult it can be to measure the incoming radiation really accurately. Outgoing is a lot more difficult. Lots of different wavelengths, changes over oceans, clouds, land, 
color choice. <coughs> um, so a much more difficult measurement that they have to make and greater uncertainties associated with that. But at least we're starting to understand a little bit of the imbalance. And it's looking like, for the most part, the energy of the Earth is pretty balanced with the exception of something less than one watt per square meter that's going into the oceans and causing long-term heating in the oceans. But things that we need to be refining in the future. We also need not only the total, but also spectral irradiances. How are the different wavelengths from the sun changing with time, and how do they affect different things within the Earth? Solar variability, these different types of sunspots factually, they don't just decrease the entire amount or increase the entire amount of energy, they vary it differently at different wavelengths. And those different wavelengths are absorbed at different levels in the Earth's atmosphere. Very short wavelengths are absorbed real high up in the atmosphere. Slightly longer, but still ultraviolet wavelengths, down a little bit lower, and the visible and near infrared mostly make it down to the surface. Um, but if we change the amount of energy in the ultraviolet or extreme ultraviolet, it can affect the atmosphere rather than the surface. So those interactions from how the sun is changing change differently what's happening at the Earth. Here's a plot during a sunspot of these are different altitudes in the atmosphere, and blue shows cooling, red shows heating, time when there was a bright sunspot at all these different wavelengths. And you see here in the visible, things overall were cooler, whereas they stayed a little normal, a little bit warmer at higher altitudes down in the ultraviolet. Um, and it roughly didn't change at all out here around one micron. Um, Plage brighter activity from the sun, more visible, causes heating here in the atmosphere, and again, more ultraviolet causing heating high up in the atmosphere. But our atmosphere changes depending on what types of activity we have, what wavelengths are changing, and where those wavelengths are absorbed in the atmosphere. So we want spectral measurements as well. Here are some spectral measurements. Fairly short wavelengths in the top plot, uh, slightly short wavelengths here and visible wavelengths down here. And you can see, first off, I should point out these are again different colors, different instruments, and they're offset already to take care of the <coughs> offsets that I showed in the previous plots by 0.3 here, 0.03, 0.5. So they've already taken care of some of those offsets, but you still see that there are differences between. Does this start to look familiar? It's the same story over again about different offsets, different instruments. Um, so, so a little bit, not quite as advanced or precise as the total measurements, but these are more difficult because they're lower energy levels, um, spectral band passes, or narrow wavelengths they like to be care about, harder measurements to make, greater uncertainties, but familiar problem. Uh, you've got to be able to link all of these measurements together from different instruments for long periods of time. Um, with some having different drifts or different offsets than the others do. But this is where we need to be able to go in the future, better spectral measurements, as well as our better total. And like I say, in research, you're never done. It wouldn't be any fun if you weren't. What do we need for climate? We need to continue the measurements with very good stability levels. We need longer duration and more stable spectral measurements. We need better understanding of how these irradiances propagate back in time and is linked to cosmogenic isotopes, tree rings, um, indicators of what our previous temperature record or solar irradiance records have been going back in time. Uh, that, that sure beats having to wait around for the next 10,000 years to figure out what the answer is for how things are changing is to try to estimate what's happened in the past. Um, we need measurements of these outgoing infrared and shortwave radiations. Um, so there are a lot of things that we would like to be able to do and are working on being able to do better for climate science. But the fundamental questions we're getting after for the solar irradiances are, what is the total amount of energy coming in? How is it changing long term? 
We need that for radiation balance. We need it to understand climate and how much of climate change the sun is causing, how variable it is over decades, over centuries. What types of activities on the sun cause what fluctuations? And how sensitive is our climate system to solar variability? So these are all things that we're working on making better with better instruments and longer duration measurements. But a bit of a link between the measurements we're getting, the sun, and climate, how we're trying to understand all of that together. So thanks a whole bunch for being here today. Right, were episodes like the um, Middle Ice Age and the Maunder Minimum seen in other parts of the world? I've only heard of, you know, Northern Europe recording that. They were. They, they do show up in other records um, in other parts of the world. Not as extreme as Northern Europe. Like I showed in some of the regional plots, Northern Europe seems to get walloped any time right. the sun changes. Why is that? Um, I, I don't know that anyone really knows, um, but just empirically, that seems to be how things have happened. The reason that we picked on the Munder Minimum in Northern Europe is, of course, that we have a lot of good temperature records for Northern Europe because it was populated at the time. But in trees and plant growth, you do have other indicators around the world. Um, even in Antarctica with the cosmogenic isotopes, you have indications that temperatures were a little different and that the sun was a little different then. But we have too many good records of people complaining from Europe. So it is the one that gets all these things. We can't real. Okay. Thanks again.